Good morning, Eastridge, and welcome to the service in person and online. We ask you to join us in worship and please stand.
Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation. Fantastic to be with you here this morning on this the day the Lord has made. We are just getting farther along into our fall season. We are sitting here at church with a great number of anticipations about uh, different ministries getting going, different programs starting up, some for the first time and some for just this new season ahead. And we are once again just leaning into anticipation for all the Lord is planning for and working towards and going to accomplish through Eastridge through this coming season. And one of the things that we've been thinking about is how to celebrate. How do we celebrate that which the Lord is doing? How do we celebrate milestones and accomplishments within our faith? And as we got thinking about our Thanksgiving Sunday service, we've decided to do something that some people are going to be very excited about. We're not going to preach a sermon. Yeah, I knew a couple of you would be in there for that. We are planning a special celebratory service, uh, all about, once again, that which the Lord has done and is continuing to do. And we're going to be, in the latter half of that service, doing a baptism service. Now, once again, the bar for baptism, scripturally speaking, I think is so minor. I'm constantly drawn back to the story of Philip and the eunuch, and the eunuch comes to uh, a recognition of who Christ is, and in that moment, in that setting, there's a scuzzy pond right beside him on the side of a highway, 
and they pull over and do a baptism right then and there. Uh, my own father-in-law, Brian, didn't get baptized until his late 60s, uh, having grown up in an Anglican church and gone through a different process, uh, but thought to himself, once again, Jesus set this model for us, and if Jesus, in all of his perfection at a later stage of life, saw the value in, for the community's sake, being baptized, then why should he not follow that exact same opportunity? So once again, we are opening this up and are excited to welcome anybody who maybe has not done it, has not had the opportunity, or for the first time is just considering it. Uh, this is an opportunity for you. And next Sunday after service, we're going to run a short baptism class, uh, once again, to get everyone ready for that. The second thing we're going to be doing as part of this service is baby dedications. Um, we were chatting as a staff. Uh, Pre-pandemic, our nursery had no kids, maybe one kid in it. Uh, there are anywhere, if they all show up, five to seven kids in the nursery alone right now. Uh, there's been a lot of kids, mine included, who has been born since this pandemic began, and we have not had the opportunity to gather as a congregation, as a family, uh, to dedicate and to do that very much as a community. As very much I always like to say, it takes a village, and if you know my kids, that is very much true. Uh, but we are looking forward to this uh, on Thanksgiving Sunday to spend our whole service just once again celebrating that which God has done, is doing, and will continue to do. So if any of those things stand out to you as an opportunity or something that you'd like to consider for yourself or your young one, please come find Pastor Ray and I and we will get you connected to that process. The next thing we'd like to announce, once again, is that our kids program, Kids Quest, is starting in about nine days' time. Now, last week we shared about a few of the different opportunities to volunteer, to participate, and we are once again still looking for individuals to come and help uh, be a part of that journey. Uh, we are excited, once again, our kids program is growing, and this is an amazing opportunity to be an outreach to our community. As parents uh, are looking for more opportunities and not a lot of recreational things are starting again for kids. So we look forward to as a church being able to provide something unique, something full of Christ's message and of the opportunity to hear the truth of Jesus Christ for those kids and neighbors in our community. And once again, we need some more people to jump in as a part of that. So if you have an interest or if the Lord is poking you real hard and you're still working that through, just talk to Jen and she can give you all the specific details for that. This morning we're going to take a minute to pray and we are going to pray for our offerings, that which the Lord has given us, uh, that we give back to him so that he can continue to do this good work, this opportunity of ministry and just continue to shape this town that we are in with the truth and salvation message of Jesus. So this morning, uh, we encourage you to take your phone, take your checkbook if you're at home, or just sit there with an uh, open-handed posture on your lap, and we are going to pray uh, for these offerings. And the offerings can be given any number of different ways. They can be mailed in, they can be done through our website, e-transfers, which is my personal favorite, or they can be dropped in the towers at the back of the uh, sanctuary this morning. So with that, let's just dedicate this time to the Lord. Let's come before him in prayer and lay all these things at his feet. Dear Father God, we thank you for that which you are doing. Lord, for the opportunities and moments that you are building. Father God, we thank you for the fact that you have invited us into this journey of change and of impact. Lord, we lift up this town. Lord, we lift up this province. We lift up this country. Lord, we seek to have your message echo and resound within these neighborhoods and we pray that you continue to prompt us on ways to be that salt and light and lord as we come into an election this week lord we pray that your hand would be through that whole thing that wherever we land whichever party comes into a minority or majority lord we just pray that we would seek to have these opportunities within our own communities to be a positive message for the truth of jesus christ and Lord, as our uh, country is, as all are, so in desperate need of your guidance, Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray that they would hear your voice if they have yet to acknowledge that, and that they would come to a personal relationship with you. Father God, as we bring you these things, we lay them at your feet, knowing that you have plans, you have moments that you have prepared, you have things that you are building. And Lord, we are excited to see and participate in those moments. So, Lord, we come before you, we lay these things at your feet. In your most precious and holy name we pray. 
Amen. At this point in time, we can also dismiss our kids to head to their programs. Pastor Sam. <laughs> Did I get this right? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning. It's good to see you. And uh, for those of you who are tuning in online or were here yesterday to celebrate the life of Stuart Weidman, it was a good time to be together and, uh, again, to be reminded of the legacy that he lived, you know. And so, but it's also a good reminder from the life that he lived about the connections that he made. And so today, we're going to take a moment to uh, begin a, a three-week series and we're going to call it Life and Love. Because in the past 18 months, 19 months, we've had um, ups and downs in terms of lockdowns. We've had to learn to use technology to connect with people. Then all of a sudden, things were loosened and we could connect together. Uh, face to face and whatnot and outdoors, it's always been good. Um, but something that always kept on recurring as I had conversations with uh, especially those who were callers. For those of you who received calls, or if, especially if you were the ones who gave calls throughout the past 18 months, um, something that was consistent, I guess, you can put it that way, was the fact that people were dealing with so much. So much that many of us are not aware of. But yet, in those weekly calls, some, some people you actually never met this person face to face. It was literally just developing a relationship over the phone. And that's amazing to hear. But because people were dealing with so much, this constant contact where they were able to pray for each other, where they were able to share with one another, and it developed a, a relationship that, that they knew they weren't alone. And that was pivotal through the past 18 months. So much so... Over the last, since last winter, there was a, a ladies group, which I will share more about later. And I just want to say that they started an alpha group that led to becoming a life group and things happened. Thing, relationships were built and we saw God move. And you've heard me say this over and over again. One step at a time, the Lord's going to lead us in what we ought to be doing as a church and for our community. And this is the season that we're entering into where it's about life and about love. It's about relationships. Last, time, last week we had a great time celebrating just the fact that it's a welcome back Sunday and I hope you enjoyed the treats. Um, but at the same time we shared about ideas, visions of reaching out to our community. But before we even get there, something needs to happen within. Our relationships within our own church community needs to be developed. And that was a need that, that we started to see. And so today we're going to be uh, going through a story that, that's probably familiar, uh, but at the same time, it, it is normally used in a different manner in terms of how God was unleashing uh, his presence, his spirit to a whole different group of people, to the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and this is the beginning of the church. But we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can open that up and, and kind of put your finger there. Um, but that being said, before we get right into it, would you just open up, pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your spirit to be present here. We invite you into this place, even just as we've sung, Lord. Thank you for being the one who teaches us. And uh, Lord, thanks for just showing, showing up. In Jesus' name, amen. So Acts chapter 10, beautiful story of Peter and this man named Cornelius. Gotta love that name. Uh, we'll get right into it, okay? Verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. A devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, called his name. A couple of things we want to point out to you. 
Keep this in mind. The name Caesarea, it actually means severance, okay? To be severed, to be, to be uh, set, um, cut off, okay? And the word Cornelius, man, it's almost like this is a story for our times. Uh, in Latin, the name Cornelius, cornu, means crown, all right, and this is how they get the name for the virus that's happening in the pandemic, the coronavirus. Cornu in Latin, is, it means horn, and, and basically for the virus, they have spike-like proteins. You've seen the images, and that's why they call it corona. And speaking of corona, I, maybe Stuart would have enjoyed this. He loved antiques, okay? And we, we talked about that yesterday, but the fact that my friend purchased a car this week, and it was the Toyota Corona. Anyone remember that? Yeah, it was neat, and this one was all kind of modified, made it look cool, but it was like a crown car, you know? It was a king car, but uh, it was just funny that that, that came up. Um, so that's where the name comes from, Cornelius. That which means that which pertains to the horn or crown. But then there's a centurion of the Italian regiment. A centurion in the Bible has always been seen in a positive light. Think about it. Who was at the foot of Jesus' cross? A centurion. And who, who declared, wow, this really was the Son of God. What about another time during Jesus' course of ministry that he encountered a centurion? What happened? He declared that I've never seen such great faith, not even in all of Israel. And it was to a centurion. And so here, in the, new, in the new era, the new covenant that's happening, Jesus has resurrected. The new church is being born. And this is a centurion who is devout, who prayed, who gave of alms generously to the Lord, who honored him. But then he receives a vision. Normally when you see an angel, you probably don't need to see a vision because that angel is giving you something of something noteworthy. But yet he receives a vision of of an angel, all right, and he calls out his name Cornelius, verse 4, please, and when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter, for he is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. So in this vision, he sees the angel who tells him, go and find this man named Simon. So this is the disciple, Peter, all right, Simon Peter. And he is with another Simon who's a tanner who takes basically uh, skin hides and, 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 and lays it out in the sun and makes leather out of it. That's kind of odd, okay? But keep in mind, remember, he's in Caesarea. He's severed. He's removed from place places and people, but now the angel is telling, or the vision is telling him to go and search for this man. He will tell you what you must do. Let's skip ahead to chapter 11. What is that he must do? Verse 13 and 14 of chapter 11. And he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Wow. That's pretty neat because you have this person who does not know Jesus, who doesn't have understanding of how to be saved, but yet honors God in what he does, okay? And he was well known in the community, which you find out in the story later. But the fact that God is moving and saying to this man, send men because I'm going to bring someone to you who will share the gospel with you. Drop down to verse 9, chapter 10. The next day as they went on their journey to draw near the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he came, he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he op he, while he, they were making ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and, let, and was let down to the earth. So now, this is talking about Simon Peter, who is in another city, 
who at the sixth hour, so this is at 12 o'clock, okay? This is the earliest part of the, I mean, the brightest part of the day. This is noontime, lunchtime. That's where he's hungry and they're making food. And to go back to Cornelius, that happened at the ninth hour the previous day. That was at 3 p.m., okay? But here at noon, he saw a trance, a vision, of, in a sense, a sheet coming down from heaven to earth. Verse 12, in it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. So as he sees this vision in this trance, he only eats kosher food. That was been the law for the Jewish people. But all of a sudden, he's seeing things that are non-kosher, and the Lord is telling him, kill and eat. He, Peter, is taking this literally as he sees it. However, as we will learn, this was not meant to be literal. This was a symbolic vision. Uh, uh, if you can put it, I think you'd call it a parabolic vision. All right? Because the animals represented people. Let's continue on because you're going to, that kind of sounds like I'm saying he's got to kill people. No, no, no. Hold on. Verse 15. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. You must not call common. This was done three times. And the object was taken up into heaven again. Okay, if you know Peter, what does three mean to him? It's, it's important to him. Because what did he do? What was his big faux pas? Don't worry, you can interact with me. I can hear you online too. He denied Jesus three times. Right? And then he wept bitterly because he knew what happened. And I, I think I've shared with you before, he got a private restoration, but then when it came to ministry, what did Jesus do? On the seashore with a nice hot breakfast, he asked him three questions and restored him back to the ministry to let him know that you are still loved and that you are still the one who's going to continue to build the kingdom. And so in a sense, with these three visions that happen, it's almost the same reminder. Hey, remember my grace and love for you. Don't be thrown off by what is taking place here. And when he said that verse to him, when God spoke, when God has, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Because he took it as literal, but it was symbolic of people. And what he's saying is, listen, there's people out there who are different. <laughs> if I can, for, for, for an easy way of explaining it. They may be different from you. But I'm telling you now, it's Okay to go and make relationship. It is okay to go and talk and eat with others. All right, we will find that out in a moment. Uh, just verse 17 real quick. Now while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from, Cor from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. These guys were not Jewish. And Peter will explain this after, but he was not to be associated with them. And so this happened ahead of time to let him know what's about to happen, the people that are about to come, don't have a care, don't have a concern, just go. Because they are not just common people. They are people that have been cleansed or have the opportunity to be cleansed, okay? In our lives, it's so easy for us to pigeonhole people into different categories based on the way we perceive who they are because of the decisions that they make, how they live, how they act, and all of a sudden we start to filter out people. I don't want to be friends with that person. I can't be associated with this person. Sound kind of familiar? We've all done it at some point in our lives. But yet, in this story, in this context, talking about those who don't know who Jesus is, 
He's saying, don't be afraid of them. Don't call them common. Because who God has cleansed are not just common people. See, the fact that Jesus went on the cross opened up the way for all people to come to know him, especially sinners. Because the only qualification for you to receive salvation is to be a sinner. That's it. But yet for us, it's so easy to say, nope, that person don't know Jesus. I don't want to associate with them. How else will they know? This is why we're talking about relationship, friends. This is why we talk about the events that we do. We want to build relationships. We truly do. To let them know that, no, we don't look at you weird. (laughs) That you are accepted for who you are as you are. And we want to invite them to see who Jesus makes us to be. And as we build that relationship, it opens up the door to be able to share. But here's the thing. I want you to see in this whole story, okay? There's always different angles. This is about relationships that God wants us to have. The fact that he would send someone from another city to those in Caesarea so that they could hear the gospel. It answers the age-old question, what happens if someone's on an island and they never hear the gospel? What happens? God will send someone. It's okay. It's not our burden to carry. We just need to be obedient. Let's hear his voice. Verse um, 19. While Peter thought about the vision... The Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. He's thinking about the vision that he just had, and the Spirit is speaking on the inside of him. Friends, let's listen to the Spirit. He will lead and guide us in all we ought to do. Drop down to verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Cornelius, who received the initial vision of the angel, then invited his friends and family to come. In this season, hey, invite them. Invite your friends and family to tune in. Invite them to the events that we put on. It's to be a blessing to others. And they get to hear the word. Seeds get to be sown. And it's so much easier because guess what? They don't have to physically come here. We get to talk to them online. Don't you love it? Isn't technology amazing? Now, some of you are probably (laughs) weary of the technology now. Verse 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and saying, stand up, I myself am also a man. And he, as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. He found many who had come together because they wanted to hear and see and understand what they must do. Verse 28 And to to, to 34, I'm going to read right through it, okay? Then he said to him, You know how unlawful it is for for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, For what reason have you sent for me? So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent for you immediately. And you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear 
all the things commanded by God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. That God does not, is no respecter of persons. That he accepts all because they are his creation. And if God, if God sees us and many, all his creation, that they are loved, that they are his created beings, why do we try to put a, a filter on and call them common and unclean? Because from what we see here, we ought not to do that. Ah, oh, Pastor Ray, that's easier said than done. You don't know what these people, I know, I, I'm not saying it's easy. But listen to the Spirit and see how he leads you to interact with others, to build relationships. Sometimes I find it so homey to be able to just talk and hang out with non-Christians. That's why I love playing volleyball. The whole community is filled with a lot of non-Christians. And it's amazing just to do life with them and build relationships with them. Because yes, we build relationships with each other within the church, but even those on the outside, that's where we find our, our nourishment, our emotional care. It's about connecting with people because that's the one thing we've all learned in the past 18 months. When things are taken away, then you realize what's mis what you've had. And that's connection. That's relationships. It's someone that you can just talk to. It's so important. I want to jump, okay, I'm, let's finish this right now. Verse 43 to 44, the last two verses. Okay, so Peter then shares the gospel, and this is the part of where he shares the gospel. To him all the prophets, Jesus he's referring to, witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. That they were sins are forgiven. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. This is what Jesus was doing. This is what God was doing. It was something brand new. The Jewish people thought salvation is just for us. But yet here to Gentiles, to non-Jews, the same spirit that fell on them on the first day of Pentecost. But Peter at that point had to preach about what the spirit was doing. And then they were baptized in it. They were speaking in other tongues. Here, they didn't even pray, folks. They were just listening to the word being preached. They were listening that your sins are forgiven through Jesus Christ. And the Spirit fell. Unprecedented. Totally new. And that is amazing to see. Because the same movement that God has been doing is continuing on in and through us. Because when he told Peter, those who I've cleansed do not call common or unclean, that by extension extends to us, is what I was trying to say before. <laughs> okay? So this is the context. Normally when you hear this, it talks about the fact that God was doing something brand new. But yet in light of our next step, in light of our context of building relationships, you know, I used to think about life groups, and it was something like, yes, we want to do it, and there was never this uh, connection in, in the mind or, or understanding of the purpose of why. And like I've always gone back to, it's one step at a time. We had other things we needed to focus on, and I believe we're walking into this season of connecting with each other to do life, to share love, so much so because without connections, without relationships, what are we? We are alone. We're secluded. And you know what happens when you're secluded? When you're alone? You start to think in your own mind and, and, and think the worst at times. I'm not saying everyone deals with this, but it's a high tendency. And as we are alone, we start to spiral. And this is where you become so vulnerable for the enemy to come and devour. Because remember, remember what the Bible says? He, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What does he steal? 
He steals the word that is planted in you. Because when the belief is wrong, then you can definitely be killed. Not physically, at times. But things get robbed from you. You start to whittle away because there's no one else around you. And you think that whatever you're going through is only you. But yet there's so many others out there who are there to support. Who are there to build and and pray for you and to do life with you. To steal, kill, and then destroy. The enemy wants you to be alone. Because when you're alone, then there is no, um, how do you put it? There's no, there's no base of help. You, there's, no, there's no connection to be able to remind you of what the truth really is. We need to process. We need to vent. We need to share to get things off of our chest. Do you know when you hold grudges and, and resentment in your own heart, it actually just hurts you the most? It causes you to stress, and stress leads to all other things that happen. Doctors will tell you that so many of the diseases that are out there these days, it's, it's from stress. But why are we so stressful? Because we're just letting our mind work, 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 thinking of all the wrong things. I remember just on social media, fear, the acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R. And we're so in tune to that. But when you have connections, you have friends, you have relationships who will say, snap out of it. We ought to have good relationships where you're able to talk honestly with people and be like, listen, what's going on? (laughs) But so much so, I mentioned this group that happened. It started with Alpha and then it became a life group on its own. And it continued on. And it was within this group that we heard testimonies that yes, the gift, of the, whole, the gift of tongues, the Holy Spirit was moving in these people. And at the same time, they were able to share life. Recognizing that the things that some have gone through, they thought they were the only ones. That there was no hope. And others would say, you know, we want to give them space. It's just something they, want, they need to go through. But in reality, they were crying on the inside. Where is everyone? Why is no one connecting? Why is no one helping? And it wasn't until this moment when they've done life together, they actually openly, vulnerably shared with each other that all of a sudden they realized, I wasn't alone. And that strengthened these relationships, this strengthened the group, and they were able to continue to move forward and know that whatever circumstances that each person is dealing with, we can pray together about it. We can share and do life together. Don't underestimate the power of prayer, friends. I don't need to tell you that. But yet, at the same time, it sounds so cliche to say it. But yet, it is so true and so powerful. There are so many things happening in this season that I believe are a result of all the praying that happened last season. And we need to continue that and develop that culture. And so, within groups, what we want to do is is not just focus on, oh, we're coming here, this is what we're going to learn. Because truthfully, as any believer, that ought to be happening continually. And so for at least a season, the shift in terms of how we ought to be doing life groups to connect with each other is to build relationships. To truly build relationships. To share who you are when you feel comfortable, but to share the deepest parts (laughs) The struggles that you've gone through. Because as we connect to each other and and we feel all cared for, it helps us to continue to move forward with his kingdom, for his kingdom. But we need to be good. We need to be cared for. I can't do it from here. Pastor Sam and I can't just do all of that for all of you. We need to connect with each other because we are part of a body. But now, going back to what I was sharing of how the enemy works, he wants you to be secluded. So, to give you context of what's happening in there, a pack of 20 hyenas are going after one lone lion by itself. And they were trying to wear him down. He was trying to bite at them and stuff, but then they kept on nipping at him. There's too many. But he's alone. And he couldn't handle 
all those hyenas. It's kind of like when we're alone and we go through our struggles and we think that, no, I can handle it on my own. I am that strong. But the truth and reality is it'll wear you down. In the same way, when you saw the second line come, what did the hyenas do? They ran away. And just as the commentator said, two male lions is way too much for a pack of 20. They can't overpower two. And that is why in the strength of relationships, in the strength of a group of believers together, you stand stronger together than apart. Why do you think God in his word says, where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst? When two or three are gathered. Because in community, in relationship, there is strength. And yet who guides you through it all? He's in the middle. God is in the middle then. So in this season, as we start, We want you to do life and love together. We have many groups that are starting, and there's already many groups that are in existence. But I've said to many, uh, the leaders already, we want to develop relationships. We need to be able to connect with each other and really share. I think over the past decade, as I observed, Yes, I've heard the same comment. Yeah, yeah, we've known these people for years, decades, triple decades, 30 years. But yet, they didn't really know those people. I remember a comment when we shared our Father's Day. We had some dads share about our lives. One person said that watched online, wow, it was so good to get to know them. But I'm like, you've been here for how many decades? And that's, those are things that start to lead up. Yeah, we know of each other, but we don't know each other. How about we take some time to actually invest in some relationships together? So that being said, if you'd like to join a group, and I think, Tara, you're going to be putting this on um, for those tuning in online. If you go to our website, eastridge.ca forward slash life dash groups, or group, singular, groups, plural, You can sign up there. Fill that form. We'll get you connected into the right place because we want to be able to connect. And as you saw in that video, friends, the enemy wants you to be alone, but we ain't going to have that because we know that in community, we are stronger together. Amen? That's just the beginning of this series. Next week, Pastor Sam is going to be talking about something awesome too, and, and we'll continue on with our series. But this is just to start it, okay? To let you know that this is the next step in our seasons together. That we want to connect. And that relationships are important. Just as we've seen through uh, the story of Peter and Cornelius. That relationships matter. If you're listening and you've never asked Jesus into your heart. That is also a pivotal moment where God wants a relationship with you. He wants to have that deep personal relationship to know that you are not alone on the inside and that you can also connect with others. It's all about relationships. And so right here, right now, I'd love to give you this opportunity just to pray with you, to ask Jesus into your heart. So if you've never... Have, have never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. I want to give you that opportunity. So everyone right here, if you want to just bow your heads, we're going to pray together. Um, you can simply just follow after me and worship team. You can come on up. And you can just say, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me so much. Thank you for wanting a relationship with me. Thank you that you care about every aspect of my life. So much so that you gave your son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to take my place, to take my sin. And on the third day, 
you rose Jesus from the grave. Free of all my sin. And have declared me righteous. Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for washing me clean and making me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, friends, if that's your first time praying that prayer, please let us know. And we want to give you a gift to start your journey. All right? And at this time, we're going to ask the worship team to close us off in song. Thanks, Mary. Please stand for our final song and join us in worship.
how great is our God. You know one thought that came as we were just singing that song? If you've never connected with new people within our own church, people you don't know, could I challenge you to do that this season? To take that step and meet someone? Build a relationship with someone new? Let's just see what happens. Amen? Let me just pray for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. Protect you and your loved ones from the Delta variant, from what we've been hearing about a Mu variant, from the COVID-19 virus. Thank you for protecting each one, Lord, under the sound of my voice. Keep them safe from all dangers, harms, accidents. And thank you for watching over them. Lord, make your face shine on them. Be gracious to them. Open doors of opportunity and favor for them. Bring restoration into relationships, Lord. Lord, lift up your counts upon us and give us your shalom peace. And all the people said, amen and amen. God bless you, folks. We'll see you next time.